talk to me about um your relationships with women and how that worked out with you spending so much time behind bars. Okay. I luckier than 99% of the guys that I did time with over the 30 to 40, 50 years now of doing time. I've always had a woman come and visit me through my entire time of doing time. Hmm. One, sometimes two, the ones that I were close to and in a relationship with prior to my arrest. And of course it was only one. And, uh, Unfortunately, when I look in the visiting room and I see it filled some days, 90%, 98% white people, a little 5% to 3% black people, I'd say, in an average visiting room, which means the sisters don't visit the brothers. Mm. And the brothers' friends, partners in the street, sporting partners, school partners, they don't visit either. When you see in the white population that being more prevalent, they do get visits. So I was lucky, so one of my children was produced in prison. The other two were, one was, my wife was pregnant when I got arrested for one. Hmm. And the other one, I was out when she got pregnant for that other one, for my, my first daughter. So three, then I have a stepchild, and that's from a black woman. Mm -hmm. And that's, so she would bring, she brought that child up when the one that has my kids left me, because she couldn't take it, 13 years of driving up to sea in prison, she couldn't handle it, so she left. And the other one then came up to fill her, to take over. I wouldn't say fill her place, but to take over. And she had a six-year-old daughter. Mm. So I'm still real tight with that, that daughter now. She's grown up and she has a son that's now just going to university. So, yeah, so my kids now are growing up. Mm. So I was in the visiting room a lot, is the best way to put it, with those women that came up. And they came up, one came up every week. So I used to tell her, don't, you're eventually going to burn out. I knew that. Then one day she said, I'm burned out. I can't do this trip anymore. Mm. So I get that. And then when I got out and I was involved in my major drugs conspiracy, arrested with me was my girlfriend. Of course, she had nothing to do with my business. But she said she'd stick by me if I promised I'd stop doing crime, flip my switch. She's in my book, Angela Mesa Kappa. So anyways, uh, I did, and she did. And she stayed visiting me for 13 years, and then I got out, and a year later, she died of cancer. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, so that was that's the trip, so... That's the way it goes, though. So that's happened to a couple of my other relatives doing long time. And long time does that. People die off when you're doing long time. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, and there's nothing you can do about it. It, it, it. My aunt died in Sudbury. I wanted to see her. And the warden said, uh, you know, if I went to see my aunt, go to my aunt's funeral, I'd have to take a day off work. And I'm like, I will pay you four times the amount of money that you pay, that you get paid for a day. And I'll pay for the escort that takes me because the escorts get paid to Sudbury, and he wouldn't do it for security reasons. Hmm. My aunts and my relatives in Sudbury are all cops and prison guards. So I'm like, I'm not going to the hood. I'm going to a funeral filled with cops and prison guards that are my relatives, and I still couldn't go. Hmm. So I'll put that in another perspective. My cousin Terry is going to his sister's funeral. My cousin Tommy, they're both in jail, they're going to his sister's funeral. The guard asked Terry, is there going to be a lot of people there? And he said, yeah, my sister was well-loved. There's going to be a 1,000 people there. The guard suddenly got sick, couldn't drive anymore, put him in a local jail overnight, and then took him back to the pen. He was too scared to go to the black funeral. And my, his brother, Tommy, says, no, nah, Tommy's playing the game better. So he says, no, nah, there's not going to be a lot of people there. Mm. And off he went, and he was able to go to his sister's funeral. That's the difference. So that's the difference, and there's racial component to that. So that's what I'm trying okay. to get at. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you, in a sense, you're kind of been lucky because you you always had people kind of checking for you. Not you people. Been, so I had women. I'm going to say this. <laughs> I had a brother that ran lacrosse league all over Ontario. Okay. So I got out, and I said, "How come you never visited me, man? In 33 years, he never visited me in prison, and yet he drove past the prison off. I get it when you're with kids and you're doing lacrosse or a sporting. You got the kids to worry about. You can't. Worry about someone else. But I'll tell you a good story about visiting. Got out, seen this. Hey, Rick, how you doing? Glad you got out, man. I was going to come and visit you. And I said to this guy, when? And he says, well, well, 10 years ago. And I said, okay, what stopped you? And he said, my car broke down. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and he's a mechanic. And he has these hot rod muscle cars. You know, he's always got a good car. He said, my car broke down. And I said, yeah. 
So I've been in like 20 years, man. And your car broke down 10 years ago. Yeah. Did you ever get it fixed? Oh, oh yeah. I got this and that. And he's describing cars, right? And I said, okay, well, that's, that's the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my car broke down. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, the importance of visits. Yes. The government knows that the more visits you have and the more community uh, connections you have, the less likely you are to reoffend. So they go out of their way to try to make visits happen. They did until the Harper government come in with restricted visits and restricted social events that happened like that. So we had four to six social events a year where your wife, your girlfriend, your mother, your father, your brothers, your sister, your friends could come in through once they get security cleared, they can come in the institution. And that socialization would help. So we would have, let's say, a, a kid's day social, doesn't matter the institution. And I would then go to 75 guys at least and say, you want to work in a kid's day social? Yeah, man, thanks. What do you want me to do? Serve ice cream, do all this, do just so they can, I can pull them in because they never get visits hmm. to pull them into my visit. I said, if you want to sit at my table, you can come and sit at my table, but you still got to do work. You still got to run around and do what you're supposed to do. That's what helped the community coalesce. Someone's going to stab someone on Thursday night, Saturdays, the social committee would go, you got a problem with so-and-so? Yeah, man, I'm going to stab him up. He owes me like 10 bucks. You know, we're having a social Saturday. Well, what's that got to do with me? On the social Saturday is everybody's family's coming. You probably won't last in this institution two days after that social as everyone's bitter hmm. that they didn't get to see their kids. They're going to take that out on you. Well, I should wait until after the social, right? 100%. <laughs> and, and that mitigates violence also, right? The social did that. And it gave you connections to the street. In other words, this is my friend. Uh, he owns a company. And when you get out, maybe you can get a job, right? That kind of stuff. So that's what social does. But I find that the uh, sisters in jail, man, and I had two cousins doing time for bank robbery in P4W when they only had one female uh, uh, adult uh, federal prison in Canada. It was P4W. So whether you're arrested in BC or Newfoundland, you still had to go there if you got two years or more. Two years or more that you had to go there. So they would say the same thing to me, all oh, because I'd be as able to go there because I was committee chairman, so I can go to committee functions there. They would, how come you brothers never visit us? And it's true. I looked in their visiting room, like it was empty of people, man. And in the mail visits, there's lineups outside the door trying to get in. And no, we haven't. We we're full. And that's when they started the system where you had to phone in for a visit because there were literally lineups of people that couldn't get in. So now you have to pre-book, so there's no lineup. Hmm. Right, so the, the the sisters aren't treated well when they go down, and oftentimes the sisters carry our stuff, they carry our guns, they carry our dope, they carry our weight, and they get charged for it, and they go to jail, and we don't even visit them. So they, of all the people in Canada who suffer the most in from crime, or from the application of crime and the punishment of crime, is the females more than males, hundred percent. Mm. Yeah, I think plenty of people don't understand. They don't understand that crime has kind of a ripple effects, right? Sure, it has, Extend a, it's across. Through, it has a ripple of, through families, yeah. through time. Uh, we're the most, I'm from the most incarcerated family in Canadian history. As mm -hmm. I mentioned to you early, I had an uncle hung mm -hmm. and I had two cousins hung. How many people you know that had relatives hung by the government? Mm. And I had several other of my relatives do time for crimes they didn't do. I mentioned in my book, my uncle Ronnie did time for a murder he didn't do. He pleaded guilty to the manslaughter rather than go down for the murder and he didn't do it, right? So, so that happens, and that's what happens to our large incarcerated family. So as a family, dealing with Canadian corrections and Canadian jurisprudence on a whole, we've suffered much over a 250-year period, 300-year period. Mm. 